Hi, it's Chris with Implied Music. Reverb. I want to talk about reverb. This is really more of a porch talk. I'm not going to call it a rant. I happen to be in the studio, but uh, it's just because I don't want to sit outside right now. <laughs> <laughs> I like my studio. It's a wonderful room, but it's a room in a house. And, uh, you know, I think it was designed as a dining room. It's a pretty dead room now. I've got treatments up everywhere. Full stuff on the ceiling everywhere. Walls, curtains, that curtain behind me there. Curtains there, carpet on the floor. It's flat, it's dead. Um, it makes a great kind of studio recording environment because this is where everything is. It all happens in one room with the exception of the piano. But what that means is any reverb that exists in my productions is artificial. And I bet I'm not alone. If you're like me, and God, I hope you're not, you're using reverb in essentially an artificial way. And I want to talk about that today. Well, First of all, let me say, if this is the second or third video of mine you've seen, and you're getting something out of these and you're not subscribed, now's the time to do it. We're building a community, and I think there are some remarkable musicians and producers in this circle of people who are interested in learning music theory and thinking about music production in a way that serves their own interests. I hope this is music theory for everyone. Okay, saying that, what I want to talk about today is how we use reverb and to some degree echo in our productions. Now, it's been a fairly recent innovation that we've been able to add artificial ambience to our recordings. And yet for today's music, we couldn't get along without it because most of us, like me, are recording in uh, tight artificial spaces. Even a high quality studio you know, when you're a band or singer songwriter, you're going to go into a space which is acoustically dead, get close mic'd, and then have ambience added, right? And that isn't the way things always were. In um, David Byrne, the lead singer and composer for Talking Heads, in his remarkable book, How Music Works, he makes a really great argument that um, architecture, influenced composers' approaches. And I think there may be something to that because if you think about the type of music that exists in these big, open, spacious cathedrals with long reverb times, um, it's these long sustained tones, isn't it? Whereas the intricate polyphonic music of the Baroque and early classical could only exist in these tight, dry, acoustically fairly dead halls. It was all meant to be performed in a certain kind of space. And we should think about the music that we make as being performed or intended to be presented within a space. Let's think about the space that we're going to have our music live in as we make it, as we record it. Well, it's probably a decade or so ago, I was at John Adams' A Flowering Tree. It's a classical piece, an oratorio with singers full orchestra at San Francisco Symphony. And I have to say that room, not my favorite symphony hall. In fact, for a long time, it was an open secret that they were using a digital reverb to enhance the sound of their recordings. I could only get a front row seat. And so I'm sitting there right in front of the first chair cellist, right behind John, who was conducting. And I loved it. I had a great time. It was it's an amazing piece of music, well worth listening to. And um, I saw John about a month later and I said, I was there, I was right behind you. And the first thing he said was, oh, it must have sounded terrible. Composers, classical composers, think about the sound of their pieces as perceived from a good way back, don't they? The sound of a space is crucial. In fact, the sound of a space can be spiritual, almost mystical, certainly ineffable. My first job out of college was as the composer and sound designer for the theater at Monmouth, a small space in uh, center, central Maine, Monmouth, Maine. Cumston Hall is a recreation of a small Baroque theater. 
it probably seats about 400. Downstairs, upstairs, hard plaster walls, but with lots of curlicues and figurations to diffuse the reverb. A high domed ceiling that focuses the sound back in. And I had to do all of my work in the booth up in the balcony when everyone was done rehearsing. So that meant I was up there at midnight working in a completely dark theater except for the ghost light on stage. And I was with the ghosts of the theater. The ghosts of the theater are those sounds, those reverberant resonances, those qualities of a space which give it its special mojo. And mojo is what we're talking about. You stick a mic up, up into a guitar and all you're gonna hear are the artifacts of the guitar. But if you back it up a little bit, you're gonna hear the sound of the room. You might hear your refrigerator, but you're gonna get something that's a little more lively, aren't you? One of the things we love about miking a guitar amp is using a ribbon mic and a you know dynamic, the ribbon mic is gonna get some room, isn't it? Part of the sound of music should be the room. Well, there's tons of different kinds of reverbs. My favorite kinds of reverbs are worldizing reverbs in the basement of Capitol Records, the, the chamber reverbs that put a couple of speakers on one side of the room and a microphone on the other. You can move the mic around, you can move the speaker around where it is on the walls. Everything is gonna change. A plate reverb works in much the same way, except you never actually put the sound out into air. A spring reverb, the same deal. The spring is what's vibrating. I was keen on algorithmic uh, reverbs for the longest time. As soon as we got those lexicon digital reverbs in the 80s, I was right on board with that right away. But my first reverb, the one that I loved the most as a young, young person on my keyboards was an, an analog bucket brigade reverb, which wasn't really a reverb, it was a delay series, but it was so like diffuse and muddled that you could create with a tight set of echoes, a beautiful reverb sound that was really saturated and gorgeous. I still love using echo for just that kind of thing. What am I going to do thinking about this and, and knowing what I know about reverb and knowing that the sound of the room and the sound of the space that, I, that I'm playing in is a crucial part of the music that I'm making. I don't know, except that I have to go into the recording process and the composing process doing it. I mean, from a practical level, I think most of us use one or two reverbs on our mixes, use channel strips and sends to, to tap those um, the reverbs. We roll off the lows on the reverb so that it doesn't get too muddy. But I think that's, we're end running something which is really essential in the beauty of music as it was practiced for most of uh, the history of sort of human artistry, right? Remember this thing which feels perfectly normal and like how we do it now has really only been around during my lifetime. That's it. And even not my whole lifetime. The uh, jazz flute player Paul Horn was on a trip to India and he'd heard that it was possible to get into the Taj Mahal late after just everyone had left. And he snuck in there with his engineer and a Nagra tape deck and his flute. And the guard who was there said, you can't set up and record here. Why not? We, you guys sing in here. We, we sing to God, the guard said. And, and Paul replied, well, what I'm doing is the same. It's devotional. And they managed to get an album recorded. The guard, it turned out, had a cousin who was an amazing singer and he called him up and they came in. That one evening, that one moment, that one place, fortunately captured, uh, is an amazing album called Inside, Inside the Dome of the Taj Mahal. And it's spectacular. The sound of the space plays a crucial role in the experience of the music. Well, I hope this has been useful. Like and subscribe and ding the bell. You'll be notified when I do my videos. 
I'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.